Welcome to Strength Based Leadership. I'm Patrick Dewar, and thank you for joining me tonight. I'm really excited about uh, the effective leadership style of strength based leadership when it comes to really helping people find their purpose, their passion, and aligning that in their profession, in the workplace, in creating a leadership, a sales, a mentoring program for de developing effective leaders. I think leaders really are uh, one of the rarest uh, people in the workplace today, and yet they're the most needed. When you think about what leader leaders are, true leaders are masters of persuasion, and they're mentors. In a word, they actually know how to sell, persuade people to take action for their own benefit. It really is about the origin of the word salesman that Zig Ziglar said was servant. When you look at the origin of the word salesperson, it really is about how can I serve you? How can I help you? One of the things that leaders need to step aside today in their ego and allow for results to really be the the focus. So often I ask that in the courses that I teach, you know, what do they pay us for results or ego? Obviously results. When we look at this concept of strength-based leadership, it is saying, okay, how can we find out how to create the most effective mentoring program, persuasion, program for the people that we lead. But so often, we need to look at what derails a leader, what derails us as individuals. And what I found over and over again is that adults under pressure are just kids in big clothing. When you think about adults under pressure, if you want to challenge the concept that adults under pressure are kids in big clothing, just cut them off in traffic. What do they do? They'll wave at you, but usually it's calling you number one in some other language. I mean, they don't act all mature. In fact, what I found over and over again is that the average emotional age of the American adult under pressure is about 11, 12, 13. Why? Because that's middle school. That's when we decided how we would respond to pressure. Think about the person that never backed down from the bully in middle school. You know, as an adult under pressure, they're going to turn aggressive instantly. What about the person that never took the mean girl or the mean guy on directly? What did they do? Well, they dialed around them and talked about them to their friends. As an adult, what do they do? Well, they'll plot your demise through your coworkers. And what about the third group? Ones that never approach conflict. When there's conflict, they run from it. They always have. As an adult under pressure, they tend to be the ones that run inside themselves and then spew emotional ink, lowering the emotional state and productivity of a team. These people are the ones that when they get offended, they become such an energy suck that as they come into work in the, in the morning, lights dim as they pass. I mean, let's get real. So the thing is, is that it, leadership is really understanding what, what uh, uh, will guide people in a way that will change everything. Now, in my workshops, I love to, this drill. Left hand, you know, you shake hands with somebody, you introduce yourself with your last name, give your first name, and then list something that a great leader does. You ever want to try this just for fun do it in in a workshop or do it in a, a meeting and have everybody stand up and meet at least four people introduce themselves by shaking left hand give your last name then your first then you know tell them something you know whether it's a what a great leader does or what's one of your hot buttons or whatever it might be it doesn't really matter what it is it's a little awkward initially but then after you've done it a few times everything shifts why 
What makes it awkward? Well, everybody will say left hand and last name. And then talking about something that either is a great leader or something that bothers them, whatever it is you asked them to do. There's always that awkwardness at first, but once you did it a few times, it's like, oh, that was easy. Left hand, last name, no big deal. But why would I do this drill in a workshop when I speak? Because it emphasizes how the the five-sixth of our unconscious mind is so powerful in guiding and directing us. You see, in our minds, we have five-sixths of our mind is the unconscious mind. Uh, One-sixth is the conscious mind. The unconscious mind, it has one agenda, keep you safe, keep you the same, keep you out of pain. You know, I think it's a little bit like Mr. Ed of old who speaks in your ear. Hey, whatever you did to get to this point, keep doing that because you've lived through all that. Left hand, last name, danger, danger, Will Robinson. You could die from this because you've never done it before. And the thing is, is that once you do it a few times, the horse goes, oh, or the unconscious goes, oh, I get it. Uh, you, you haven't died. So, you, you know, you lived great. Red alert off. Let's, you know, move forward as a release. And the reason why I would introduce a topic like this with, with a, a drill like this is because many times when we try to help somebody learn something new, their unconscious will fight you tooth and nail because the, whole, the unconscious thinks that, hey, you could die from this. It doesn't think logically. It doesn't think Im anything other than image, emotion, and safety. Different is dangerous. That's what it thinks. So the, the thing is, is that when you go into a new topic like this, anytime you hear, you, that won't work for me. I could never do that. That's your horse talking. And you need to let it know. You'll live. Let's do it anyways. And do it three or four times just to get it out of the way. Get that fear out of the way. And then watch how there's this release to begin to integrate anything. I love to start with a couple of foundation stones because I believe what you believe about you is completely made up and you are the author. I also believe that hot buttons are seeds of self-doubt and limiting beliefs. We should confront them with the truth. Now, here's an important thing. If you're the author of what you believe about you, have you always held the pen, the writing utensil? Yes or no? Well, some people say yes, some people say no, some people say no. Well, it's all made up. But let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. When I was in college, first day of college, I sat down with my academic advisor. They looked at my test scores, looked up at me and said, Mr. Dewar, do you realize that 99% of all the rest of the freshmen enrolled are placed above you? Um, well, we're wondering if you realize that our statistics show that people of your academic stature don't usually last six weeks at this university. Are you sure you wouldn't rather go to a junior college first? Make sure college is your cup of tea. I kid you not. All I could think is, wow, I've never been called an idiot so proficiently in all my life. And then all I could think is, you know what? I'll send you an invitation to my graduation because I'll never quit. And I set out to prove them wrong. And I know many of you that are watching this, that's what you would do. You'd set out to prove them wrong. I studied 17 hours a day, seven days a week for the first two years in college. At the end of my sophomore year, I had achieved an overall grade point average of 1.99. Yep, I missed it. In fact, my dean just pulled me aside and said, Pat, if you don't pull it out next semester, you are going home. Welcome to second semester scholastic probation. That summer I worked in the oil field to pay for school, which I usually did, and, and I had some time in the evening, so I went looking for the right information. I figured someone in history had been where I was at, 
needing to learn how to process information, learning, uh, needing to learn how to remember more. And so, you know, I went looking for it and I found a tool and I integrated it that summer and, and things began to change. The next semester, I went from a 1.99 to a 3.25 in one semester. I never had to worry about my grades again. A couple of years later, got my BS degree. <laughs> no, it's not all BS. But when I came out, I had this huge hot button on my shoulder. I never wanted to be called an idiot ever again. So what did I do? I went back through those resources and any other resource that I could find to help me process information faster and remember more. I did that for the next 20 something years. I tell you this because when I was in my 40s, I had the opportunity to sit down with one of my managers and the gist of the conversation went like this. He said, Pat, you're really good at what you do. We would love to raise you into management, but you suck with people. I mean, seriously, people hate you. I'm thinking, dang, is this supposed to be constructive criticism? Because I, <laughs> I didn't see the upside of that one. But he wasn't trying to be mean. My manager wasn't trying to be funny. He was saying, Pat, if you stay the way you are, you will stay where you are. I said, no, no, I own my career. I'll do whatever it takes. I want to be a leader in every area of my life. Along the way, I, I crossed a really big bridge. I found that teaching was an internal motivational gift. This internal motivational gift when I first saw it, the first thing I saw was, no way, I, couldn't, I can't be a teacher. I'm not smart enough to be a teacher. Why? Because in the back of my mind, all I could hear was 99% of all the rest of the freshmen are old, a place to bug you. Would you agree that that's just a limiting belief when you're 40 something years old? And, that, and what do we do with limiting beliefs? Confront them with the truth. But what truth? The adult truth, the new truth. See, I'd learned how to process information faster. I'd learned how to um, remember more. So I confronted that limiting belief with the new truth, the adult truth. Eliminating that limiting belief. And actually taking out the hot button at the same time. You see, as I began to learn what I was doing with others that made me suck with people, I found that I was, well, I had become basically an educated idiot. I, I knew so much. And, and anytime I got into a conversation with somebody, I wanted to show how right I was, which means how wrong they are. And most people really resist that. They back up a little bit, think about in their mind what they're, they're, what you're talking about, you know, and, and then all of a sudden Wolverine shows up, blades come out and maybe it's on and then you suck with people. I had to change what goes into my mind. One of my mentors, I'm so grateful for this man. He said, you're what you are and where you are today because of what's gone into your mind. If you want to change what you are and where you are, you have to change what goes into your mind. You see, Zig Ziglar said that. I'm, I'm a big fan of his. I'm not trying to promote him. He, he passed away years ago. But I was grateful to be able to work with him in 2005 as one of his speakers. And he said, Pat, you got to rinse and repeat enough on anything to get things past the conscious mind into the unconscious mind. See, the stuff that I'm talking about today, I'm, I'm not selling anything other than trying to help leaders begin to grow leaders begin to have a mentoring program because so often we become a leader and we really don't study it. We don't really go through management programs. We just get out there and do what we can. <clears throat> and then we're supposed to raise up people around us and, and, and to the point that they can take our spot, but 
how many people get this mindset of, I'm afraid if I teach them as much as I know, they'll take my place. No, what will happen is you'll grow to the next level. When, I, when I'm talking about strength-based leadership, I really am trying to share how to find your purpose, your passion, and your profession. See, once you begin to understand where your gifting is, everything in your world shifts. See, as I began to understand that teaching was an internal gift, so I began to use that gift. I figured if it was in me, then I'd offer it up. And so I began to just open, open myself up to, if you need a teacher for something, if you need a speaker for something, I could, I, I could help out. One of the biggest moments of change in my career is when my manager looked at me and said, Pat, you know, you have no charisma. And I thought, really? You got to be kidding me. And, he, and I kind of laughed. I just laughed at him. He said, why are you laughing? I said, because you got two guys on your team that have been to my workshop over in Richardson. See, I had been teaching people how to process pain, how to find their purpose and their passion for several years before this point. Because I got a hold of this, and for the first time in my life, I was swimming with the current in the river of life, operating in what I was gifted to teach, to be. My identity had shifted to someone who understood that when I'm in my element. I cannot get tired. You know, I believe all of us have one primary, internal, motivational gift that we could derive our purpose from. On the screen, you're seeing this test that I would walk people through that I went through. And I was just amazed at how powerful it was. All that it is, is we're, I would want to walk you through this process. And if you have an interest in this test, uh, I'll give you my email a little later. You can just email it. I'll send it to you. Any other information on it? And if there's a way that I can be of service, I would love to. But one of the things that I want to make sure is that people actually see this process. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I know that a lot of coaches, they tend to be, you know, speaker types. but you know what? It doesn't really matter whether you're somebody who works with your hands or speaks with your mouth. In, in this test, though, I would encourage you to choose one or the other if you think back in your life what you naturally have tended to do. Let me show you what I'm talking about. See, if you're somebody who works with your hands predominantly, not a person that speaks with their mouth a lot, someone who just works with their hands, do you respond more to people's practical needs or how people feel? If it's how people feel, you'll want to put your initials in the number one spot or write down the number one right now. And actually, you're done at this point. If you're somebody who works with your hand, don't do anything else. Just I'm just making sure that those that, that are, are wanting to take the test, I can walk you through the process. If you're still, if you weren't, num, you know, number one, you know, would you rather help someone by doing something for them or giving them money? If it's doing something for them, write down number three. If it's giving them money, write down number four. Now that's for the, typically uh, a person that's an introvert that likes to work with their hands. They're very, uh, you know, I want to say kinesthetically oriented. And with that, all the work with your hands people are done with this test. Now, let me stick around. Let me show you what, how all this wraps together. But for the, the people that speak with their mouth to form an opinion about something, would you probably go by what you feel or believe already or research it until you're confident? If it's research it, write down number two. If it's go by what you feel or believe already, then... In giving advice, would you give practical steps of action or quote a reference as a basis for action? If it's quote something, you're going to write down number five. If it's give practical steps of action, you're still with me, then do you find that you adapt easily to any situation or get frustrated with 
delays in red tape. If it's adapt, number six, you'll write that down. If it's get frustrated, red tape and delays, then write down number seven. Now let me show you how all this comes together. Number one, mercy. Number two, teachers. Number three, servers. Number four, giver. Number five, professing. Number six, exhortation. And number seven, administration. You see, these gifts are in us. And if we are operating in our gift, we can't get tired. Now I'll go over each of these real quick. And, and like I say, if you want the material, you can email me, no big deal. But I wanted to make sure that you had these concepts first. So mercies, always looking for the good in people, is attracted to people who are hurting and distressed. It's more concerned with emotional distress than physical needs. Loves to do thoughtful things, tends to be indecisive. These people are high empathy, really high empathy. They feel everything that's going on around them. That's your gift. If that's your gift, then, then this is, you're somebody who actually people tend to want to share their hurts with you. Just naturally. You, if it's at your desk or on a park bench, it doesn't matter. People just share their stuff with you all the time. Number two, teaching. Presents the truth in a logical, systematic way. Loves to study and do research. Actually might have five or six books going at the same time. Tends to neglect the practical application of truth. We might know what to do. We don't always do what we know to do. Is easily sidetracked by new interest. Tends to be emotionally self-controlled and often has a select circle of friends. The teacher typically is someone who listens to the speech patterns of other people and then creates a... Um, a way of expressing that image in their mind, in the, in the voice of, in the words of the people they're talking to. Service. Number three, easily recognizes practical needs and is quickly to meet them. These are the people that show up early, stay late, and help with the cleanup. Has a hard time saying no. Needs to feel appreciated. Tends to do more than is asked does not want to lead others in projects, typically to let other people. Tends to be a perfectionist, is critical of others who do not help when there's an obvious need. Now, some people might, I'm just, I just feel it out there that some people might be thinking, well, these are like the personality styles. Actually, not completely. And the reason is that these are areas of gift in us that as we use them, we can't get tired. We love to operate in these gifts. There's a difference in communicating to someone's internal power center than it is just communicating in their language. It's just a level of rapport that's a little deeper than some of the things that are out there. I've taught all the different personality styles and I've seen them. And the one thing that I noticed about this is that when people understand not their communication style, but where their passion center is, everything lights up in their world. See, if you were number four, giving givers, yeah, they give freely of their money, possession, energy, and time, but it isn't necessarily all about them just emptying their pocketbooks. They want to feel a part of everything they contribute to. They may use financial giving as a, a way to get out of responsibilities, but they'll also pressure others to give. I've seen people in this gift attract whatever's required. I had a lady I worked with when I was in corporate America, and she wanted to take bears for a Christmas drive for stuffed animals, you know, to a Christmas drive. And what was so amazing is, is that when I saw her on Monday, she was introducing the idea to me. The following Monday, when I saw her again, she had actually collected over 300 bears in five days for this project. She was the one that always collected the the birthday money, you know, two bucks for so-and-so's birthday. I mean, I didn't even like so-and-so, but you know what? I had two bucks in her hand before I knew what happened to me. They attract the resources. 
many times they're very good in business. And we'll talk more about that because they understand seed, time, and harvest. They understand sowing and reaping. They understand the concepts that go into building a good business. They also tend to be people that will give many times anonymously. Number five, professors. These are the folks that everything is either black or white. They see the flaw in the ointment. They see the error in the plan. The, they perceive the characters of individuals and groups. They can be frank, outspoken, evaluative, and blunt. They have strong opinions and convictions, may be intolerant of others' views, and may struggle with self-image problems. These people, you will want them on your team to identify where things are gonna break because they will see it and they will want to speak the truth in that environment, very direct. Exhortation, these are the encouragers, the cheerleaders. They love to encourage others. In fact, their superpower is breaking the chains off of other people, saying, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. People believe them, it's amazing. Chains snap, people stand up, go, yeah, I can do it, and they'll run through a wall for you. They focus on working with people. They find the truth in experience. They make decisions easily. They expect a lot of themselves and others. They can be outspoken and opinionated, interrupt, whatever. And um, they, they tend to be very eager. They're the tigger. They're the, the ones that really raise the state, uh, the state of a group when they walk into a room. High, high encouragement, exhortations. And then the last is administration, number seven. Highly motivated to organize, willing to assume management responsibilities, easily organizes resources to accomplish tasks. These are the ones that will bring order to chaos naturally. They have like laser vision of what needs to happen in a crisis. These folks can be uh, very good with letting others get the credit. They know when to keep old methods. They develop an outer callousness due to being a target for criticism. When you're out front, people tend to throw darts at you. They tend to get really thick skin with it, and it's like, look, just put on a big boy pair of underwear. Let's move forward. And uh, what's really nice about these folks is that many times they will see what needs to take place, bring the resources together, and make it so. Sometimes they don't always delegate well, but once they learn how to delegate, they can be really amazing. Now, here's how this all kind of comes together. And I could say this, you know, I told you if you wanted to, you could even text me at my, that's my cell number, 817-368-6843, your email address, and I'll send you both of those pieces of information if you'd like. Now, the one thing that I encourage is, is include your name so that I at least can, when I send it back to you, I'll have a name to address it to, but you know, at least your first name. I'm just saying I want to be able to send this stuff to you and uh, you know, we can go from there. Now, here's where I want to go with this. Finding your purpose, one of the things that I, I saw years ago was that there are there were these three guys, Bill Bright, Francis Schaefer, Lauren Cunningham, and they had um, these insights that there were seven basic mountains, pillars of influence in a culture that change a culture. Religion, family, education, media, arts, entertainment, government, and business. What's fascinating is that the seven gifts line up nicely with each of those mountains or pillars. Mercy, family, teaching, education, serving, arts and entertainment, giver, business, professing, media, exhortation, religion or spiritual kind of everything in the spirit of man, and then administration, government, leadership. And I just think it's fascinating that once you understand your primary motivational gift, purpose, passion, it's interesting to me that now you have a, a part of the culture to tap into, to offer your gift in that area, so that you have no limits in what you can do, be, have, 
an impact in the culture and the nation. Teachers, education, I'm a speaker. That's what I've been doing for the last 18 years. I've taught all over the country in all 50 states. And I don't get tired of it. I just love to, to be able to try to impart something to others to help them grow. Server, arts and entertainment, fascinating. I have a buddy of mine that, that when he took this test, he came back server. And what was fascinating, he is a movie maker. He literally is making movies to impact the culture of the nation. Givers business, professing media, which makes sense because we wish and we hope that someday the media will actually tell the truth in every area. Exhortation, encouragement, it's that, it's the building up courage within the lives of others to, to inspire Fill the spirit of man with freedom. That's an encouragement. Encourager. And then administration. Government. Leadership. Just amazing. I'm just trying to share this with you because as we grow, as we begin to mentor others, these are the mentoring plans in a sense where you tap into what a person's gift is and help them develop a plan. What's their calling? What do they want to be? Who are you? Who are you becoming? How can you use the gift for others to touch a nation, to touch a culture? That's what we're talking about. So, you know, I've, I've told you, this is a no selling seminar. I'm just throwing, setting this stuff out there. Uh, if there, if you have questions on it, please contact me. If there's something I can do to help great, but really I just wanted to give you some good information tonight on ways that you can tap into your own tools and then take those into the marketplace to make a difference to those you lead. Please notice that when I say that leadership is all about persuasion, speaking to a person's power center, their passion, communicating to what they are filled with energy from, that gift, creates such a rapport that it can increase your ability to mentor, it can increase your sales, it can increase your, your ability to communicate more effectively in every area of your life. I hope that this has been a benefit to you. Thank you so much for being with me tonight, and we'll talk to you next time.